So I spend a lot of my day job talking to students about journalism and about the reasons why journalism is important to local communities, to society and to democracy. Um, so I've had over 10 years or so I've had a teaching, quite a lot of seminars and lectures where we've looked at things like what is the purpose of journalism, what do we want from our journalists, what role do journalists play in society, how does this relate to democracy, um, and increasingly, does it matter who owns the press? Um, so a lot of our teaching in the media studies team in Portsmouth University is focused on media ownership and some of the problems. So obviously, uh, independent, non-advertising funded model is the ideal, but most people access uh, their information about things from everything to do with voting to day-to-day -day life from mainstream media mm. provision, which is invariably commercially owned. Um, across 10 years of teaching, most of my students have agreed that there are certain principles um, and around journalism and that good journalism is based on certain aims in society. Um, so the idea that journalism should provide us with information, so the information we need to be citizens and to make decisions in our lives. That journalism and good journalism should be about scrutinising the powerful that it should also be about providing a voice for everyone in society and for all sectors of society. I'm currently doing some research on the representation of the Grenfell Tower fire and I'm interested in community activities that will invite people from the local community who've been affected by issues around flammable casing on their housing so that universities and also newspapers like Star and Crescent invite the people in um, that are normally the subject of discourse rather than involved in it. Um, and equally the revelation of injustice is something that many of my media studies students are quite interested in. Um, we're perhaps obviously all here tonight because we've got similar interests. Many of us will be familiar with the idea of the fourth estate. Uh, historically, that's the idea of an independent press that will provide a check against the power of certain individuals. Historically, that would have been the monarchy, the government and clergy. And now increasingly, we could say it's the threat of advertising and commercially owned media. <coughs> to that end, many of us might lament the degree to which commercialisation has undermined the fourth estate function um, of the media. Many of us have lost faith in mainstream media provision and in commercial journalism. Um, and even before Trump and recent news agendas around fake news, we've perhaps lived with a growing sense that the news media has become a business and that it's not one that's run in <coughs> our interests or in the interests of society or the public good. Um, because I am a media studies lecturer who normally relies on PowerPoints and therefore can never commit anything to memory, um, and also a too vain to wear glasses, I'll have to have a quote that I want to read. It's a quote from Daniel Berkowitz, a media uh, theorist who's argued, despite journalism's stated goal of depicting reality, the news media, tightly interlocked at top levels with our powerful institutions, have an interest in preserving the larger liberal capitalist system by helping maintain the boundaries of acceptable political discourse. I'm going to come back to some of this in some examples of local news reporting in a minute. Um, Berkowitz continues that the media establish what's normal and deviant by the way they portray people and ideas, and that's something certainly in our teaching in media studies we look at things like poverty porn, the demonisation of people on benefits, uh, the representation of the migrant crisis, which I think we'll all agree should really be called the refugee crisis. So interested in the degree to which um, journalists often collude in commercial enterprises with the powerful. Um, I don't know if any of you noticed this, although I imagine that it's the kind of room where we might have focused on this kind of stuff. Last week, the government announced very quietly um, the decision not to extend the work of the Leveson Inquiry into Leveson 2. Um, so that's an inquiry into press standards. The announcement was made while our largely deregulated national press uh, were fixating upon the snow. Um, so we could say it's literally an example of burying bad news. Um, and again, um, if we think about this in relation to media ethics, a theorist, Andrew Belsey, has argued the proper practice of journalism must sometimes be subversive and anti-establishment and expose what those in power would rather keep concealed from the public 
to whom they should be accountable. And certainly, um, having been desk buddies for a number of years at Portsmouth University with Tom, I know that this, I, this is an idea, this subversion bit, certainly, you've got that nailed, I would say. I do try. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what journalism, good journalism, is supposed to be. Um, in reality, as we know from investigations such as Leveson 1, we tend to see instead packs between powerful elites who are supposed to represent us, uh, global billionaire newspaper owners and the politicians who court favourable coverage from them uh, in return for further deregulation of the media. Um, so I'm of a certain age whereby I like to tyrannise my young students with references to Margaret Thatcher uh, and the favourite exchanges between Thatcher and Rupert Murdoch which paved the way for our deregulated commercial media that we now enjoy today. Um, Tying in obviously with the theme of the evening and the brilliant work of Star and Present, um, I'm interested in the degree, and I'm sure we all are, the degree to which local journalism can provide some kind of uh, salve to the wounds of commercial journalism. But if we think about what local journalism can offer, it can offer us um, a sense of society, of democracy, of inclusion, Increasingly, as our news provision moves online and uh, we're able to interact with it, we can have our own voices heard within the media. Certainly, as we've seen with Star and Crescent, who are normally very modest, um, the investigative journalism is a key aspect here. Um, it allows providers such as Star and Crescent to inform voters in the decisions they need in order to cast uh, votes. Um, we want to hold local officials and politicians to account um, and also just to help the readers of local news to make decisions and to be able to contribute in a communal process of enlightenment rather than one of demonisation and trivia, um, which if we're talking about the political sphere is really the degree to which it's been degraded uh, through a commercial framework. Um, if we look at what a media theorist Chris Alley has argued, local news is the linchpin connecting community life to larger ideas like democracy in the public sphere. It's essential to community solidarity, identity and everyday life. Now, we could argue that the greater the disconnect between the citizens um, and the public and the journalists who represent them, the greater the public mistrust there is in journalists. And we know probably, um, certainly as a result of uh, Leveson and some of the checkbook journalism and news of the world journalism that the public trust in journalists is right up there uh, with, I don't know, employees of the BBC in the 1970s <laughs> and uh, estate agents. Um, and there's reason for that. I mean, we've seen recently in debates about the pay gap at the BBC, you know, the old Fleet Street model which has been embraced of uh, you know, by many print and broadcast journalists of white middle class men um, and I'm thinking about this in relation to the recent um, BBC scandal over Carrie Gracie's pay, so the China editor who stepped down as editor of, <laughs> of China's news desk because she found out she was being paid less than her male counterparts. Uh, and then John Humphreys and John Sopel were caught on mic having a good old laugh at the failure of Carrie Gracie to have attained the same pay scale as them and also offering in a joking way to divert some of their inflated salary towards her. Um, we could say that these are the kinds of journalists and the kind of journalism that's out of touch with their readership and the social challenges that face them. The housing crisis, increasingly uncertain employment in the gig economy, a sense of powerless and dislocation, a sense of being left behind by politics, by media and in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, again, because media lecturers always rely on quotes from cleverer people. Uh, David Hart has argued, the last decade has seen increasing agreement among scholars that local news has become less plural, less local in its orientation, less embedded in and reflective of local communities, as well as less critical and independent from its overwhelmingly elite sources. 